Thank you, Larry. May God add his blessing to the reading of the scripture this morning, and may the words from my mouth be what we each need to hear. Today I want to talk about confidence. There's a story in the Old Testament, and most of you have, I'm sure, heard this story in Sunday school or somewhere along the way in your lives. It's about young David. Young David was a shepherd. He was going out to face the giant Goliath. Remember that story? Saul, the king, gives his armor to David. And David puts on all this armor, his breastplate, his sword, his helmet, and all this stuff. And one version of the Bible says it like this. David tried in vain to go. The poor little guy couldn't handle all that armor. It was heavy. It was too much for him to bear. And so he took the armor off and he went out to face Goliath with God's armor only. He said, you come at me with sword and shield, Goliath, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. He will give me victory this day. Then the young shepherd boy, you know the rest of the story. He slayed the giant. It'd be great if every one of us could go out and face the world wearing the armor of God. Our lives would be changed. Young people at school, men and women on the job or wherever you might go, battling temptation, overcoming discouragement in this life, standing up to the bullies of this world, my wish for each of you is that when you leave this place here, that you will leave in the confidence that there is an unseen strength and a power that goes with you everywhere you go every day. Because confidence makes a big difference in life. Ed McMahon, remember him, Johnny Carson's sidekick? Ed McMahon said that his father impressed him at an early age with a favorite saying. Here's what his father said. Always walk into a place like you belong, and most people will believe that you do belong. McMahon had trouble when he was a kid. He had trouble with other kids in school. He said, I went to 15 different schools before I finished high school. Can you imagine? 15 different schools. You see, my father was a fundraiser, and we were constantly traveling. Consequently, I would be in a school where no one knew me, and that was a tough situation. You know how cruel kids can be. I'd be in New York one year. Next year, I'd be in Massachusetts. We moved all the time. He always felt like an outsider, but he refused to give up. He followed his dad's advice. No matter how uncomfortable I was, I always tried to look like I was supposed to be there, like I belonged. And it worked. He said, I moved from a naturally shy kid, a wallflower, to being very outgoing. Confidence is important in life. But where does confidence come from? For some people, it's natural. That's just their personality. That's just their genetic makeup. Teddy Roosevelt was one of those people. Teddy was a very outgoing person with a big personality. A story's told that on Teddy's first day in heaven, he said to St. Peter, your choir isn't very good. You need to reorganize it now. So St. Peter told him, go ahead, reorganize it. Roosevelt said, okay, I'm going to need 10,000 sopranos, 10,000 altos, and 10,000 tenors. St. Peter said, well, what about the basses? He said, I'll handle the basses by myself. <laughs> Where do you get confidence like that? Some people seem to be born with it. For the rest of it, we have to build confidence with time. We know, first of all, that confidence takes preparation. The secret of Harry Houdini's success as America's greatest magician was lots of preparation, and timing was everything. And he was only caught off guard once. Houdini did amazing things. He escaped from a crate wrapped in chains at the bottom of New York Harbor. 
He escaped from graves. He squirmed out of straitjackets while he was hanging in midair. He even freed himself from sturdy ropes tied to a stake while fire burned around him. One day, on a dare, he let a boxer, a professional boxer, hit him full force in the stomach. But his timing was off by just a split second, and the boxer's fist slammed into him before he was ready, and that hurt. Houdini managed to pull himself together, and he coughed, <clears throat> not that way, let me get set. And he said, let's try this again. He got ready and he said, now hit me. The boxer hit him again this time. He smashed his fist against a rock hard stomach because Houdini was ready. Ten days later, Houdini died from the injury which he suffered when that boxer punched him. He had not been sufficiently prepared that one time. I've had dreams, and I think most people have had dreams, where you walk into a meeting unprepared or you, or you, you, you walk into an important situation where you're expected to do something and you're not ready for it. And it's, it's an awful feeling. Part of our preparation for life is spiritual preparation. Paul mentions the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Book of the Month Club sent out a survey to its members. The survey listed a number of recent books, and it asks, beside each title, it asked, Had you read, have you read this book? Next to books that he hadn't read, someone wrote, not personally. How can you read a book if you don't read it personally? I imagine that many of us would answer the same way if that question were asked of us about the Bible, about the Word. We know a little bit about, from the, about the Bible from church and Sunday school, but we haven't read it much personally. If we read and study a little bit more, I guarantee it will change our outlook on many things in this life. That's the first step in confident living. Be prepared. Secondly, try to live each day so that you don't have to apologize for anything you did at the end of that day. There is no more destructive or harmful emotion than guilt. Yet some people live with guilt. In the book, Getting to Know God, the author talks about a man who came to his doctor with symptoms of very serious illness. But when, he, when the doctor examined him, he found the man to be very healthy and he sent him on home. In two weeks, he was back. He said, Doctor, I want you to examine me again. I'm at my wit's end. I feel very bad. I'm nervous and upset. I can't eat or sleep. I'm in great pain. I'm totally miserable. The doctor repeated some extensive tests, and again, he examined him every way he could possibly think of, and again, he could find no physical, physical cause for this man's illness. He said, the doctor said, as far as I can see, there is nothing wrong with you physically. Your body is not functioning normally for sure, but I find no evidence of any physical trouble. And then he asked him, can I ask you a question? What's going on in your life? Do you have something on your mind? Maybe something on your conscience? Have you done, done something that you regret? Is your heart burdened with guilt or something? Well, the patient was insulted, and he was angry, and he said that he had come for medical advice and not for a sermon, and he stomped out of the doctor's office. Well, he went home and he thought about it. And after a few weeks, he returned with a different attitude. And he said, Doctor... I want to confess that you put your finger right on the problem, the truth of my illness. I have done something very wrong. And then he went on to tell the doctor's story of how he had stolen money from his brother 
when his brother had trusted him to run his business while he was out of the country for a long period of time. No one knew that he had stolen this money, and no one will, would ever find out. He covered it that well. But his conscience knew it, and guilt infected his body. The doctor said, well, how much can you afford to pay this guy right now? And he said, I could give him $2,000. He said, then write the check and write a letter admitting to your brother what you did, including your plan to repay him for the rest of what you owe him. He did that right there in the doctor's office. He sealed the envelope, and they walked together to the mailbox. And as the man dropped the letter into the mailbox, the doctor said that his face showed that he had dropped a great burden from his life. How can we walk confidently and look back over our shoulder in fear? We can't. No wonder, Paul says to us, stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. That's a great secret in life. Tell the truth. You know, just tell the truth the first time. Then you don't have to remember what you said so that the next time when someone questions you, you can't recall what, what lie you told them last time. Just tell the truth the first time. Then you develop the habit of what's called integrity. Then you don't have to look back. Be prepared. Live your life in such a way that you don't have to apologize for anything you did at the end of that day. And then there's one more step to confident living. Remember who you belong to. This is where the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and above all, prayer comes in. A great astronomer once gave a lecture where he talked about the Milky Way and all its millions of stars, how many of them were larger than our sun and how there were many, many more beyond that and that man would continue to discover throughout human history more and more stars as the years went by. He knew it. His name was Dr. Russell. And after this lecture, a lady said to him, Dr. Russell, if what you say is true, if the world is so tiny and the universe is so great, can we really believe that God pays any attention at all to us little human beings? And the astronomer answered her, that all depends, ma'am, on how big of a God you believe in. He knew about the kind of faith that gives confidence. Keith Miller gives a funny example of the power of prayer in one of his books. He tells about his seven-year-old daughter. Her name was Mary Lou. Well, Mary Lou was very stressed over a chin-up test that she was going to have in PE class the next day. She, she could only hold herself on the bar for four seconds. Another little girl named Susan could hold herself up on the chin-up bar for 24 seconds. Mary Lou and Susan, you see, both had a crush on the same little boy. And so Mary Lou just thought that if she could improve her time and beat Susan on that chin-up bar, then maybe this little boy would think that she was cooler than Susan. So her father suggested that when she did her chin-ups, that she pray for God's help. And so the next day, she came running in after school and ran right past her dad, happy as could be. He went after her and grabbed her and, and said, Honey, how did you, how'd it go today? And she said, How did what go? And he said, The chin-ups. How long did you hang on the bar? She said, 25 seconds. 25? He said, How'd you do that? He said, I did what you said, Daddy. I prayed. He reached for his notes and a pencil because he thought something really profound was going to come out of his little daughter's mouth and he wanted to write it down. And he said, what did you pray? She said, well, Daddy, when I got up there and started getting real tired, 
I whispered to God, let me beat Susan, let me beat Susan, let me beat Susan. Now that might not be a model prayer, but it's a big improvement on what we sometimes do. We live our lives as if there is no God, as if the only power we have is our own, and as if we are whipped before the battle has even started. Walk with confidence. Put on the whole armor of God. That's the key to confident living. Be prepared. Behave yourself in such a way that you're guilt-free. Remember who you belong to. Amen.